what you have is that you're too friendly on the outside and you're too smart on the inside. So that that's that, that's like the lethal combination uh, where people can't discriminate against it. Come on. Good. Welcome to the Naked Texture Artist. On this podcast, I have deep and honest conversations with visual effects and animation veterans about their challenges and growth as working artists. My name is Mark Pierre Sondergaard, and I'll be your host. Let's get started. I'm happy and excited to return to my conversation with Manuel Huertas Marchena. You probably remember how I introduced him as the ninja back in episode one. Since making that episode, we're now facing the big famine or drought caused by the Hollywood strikes. Something that in years to come will prove a turning point for the visual effects industry. I'm pretty sure of that. But also a situation that highlights Manuel's ninja-like qualities. Our conversation here is from back in September 2021, but Manuel's thinking on both how to be an artist and how to manage your career is still valid and ever important two years later. Manuel shares his experience breaking into visual effects, and if he could do it all over again, what advice would he give his younger self? We talk about assets that can break you. Yeah, that's one of the themes that was etched into my mind early in my career. And we also discuss how Manuel works from the set point of a formula or a technique on every asset. So as the conversation progresses, we're getting into the nuts and bolts of being a working artist. Plenty to enjoy and learn from, if you want to be a ninja too. So let's go. Have you ever, have you ever found yourself uh, being discriminated against? No, dude. Actually, uh, I, I thought about... Uh that the other day because I was speaking with a friend from Peru and then you know he he was asking me when I was learning French and you know how people treat you and I would say likely not I cannot speak with uh, I cannot speak for everybody of course right but I would say that uh, I would like to think that if you thought you have a good attitude people are going to see over the fact that you speak or not language or you or you are part of or not from a culture I think so. Uh, I think that, um, you know, of course, there's cases of, of real discrimination, but a lot of the times I think people put themselves in that place without that necessarily being the, the thing that's happening, because there's a lot of things going in your head when you question yourself a lot. And there's other things that happen for real, right? When somebody really treats you in a discriminatory way, which is obvious and acceptable. Um, in my almost 10 years working in CG, I would say, no. I haven't, I haven't get that experience. I would say, oh, dude, look, this time happened this. No, I think the most that happened to me is like, uh, like a joke about llamas, which I love. <laughs> I think they're funny. And I will tell you something else. It, really? Llamas? Is that that's the best people can do for a South American? Uh, you know what? Um, they can also make jokes about cui. You know what cui means? No. So cui in French <laughs> means balls. But in Spanish, it means guinea pigs, and we have a lot. Oh, so, oh okay. The first time I met French, you know, uh, I was saying, yeah, I, I love cui, right? And cui in, in Spanish is, re- is written C-U-Y. And they're like, you like cui? Like, what, what the fuck? And I'm like, cui in French means balls. So I was like, oh, fuck, okay, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I, I, I like those kind of jokes. So, you know, some people... They, See, they I think I think you're you're what you have is that you're too friendly on the outside and you're too smart on the inside. So that that's that, that's like the lethal combination uh, where people can't discriminate against it. That's right. Come on. So you know, yeah. no, no, I'm not bothering you. up seriously, I just I just call it like I see it. Thank you. you but so you've always you've almost been ten years in the industry or thereabouts, uh, coming up on a decade now or something like that or. Yeah, I mean, I started uh, I started in film in 2011, and I had some CG work uh, professionally. Well, you can say like, you know, the first work I've done 2010. So oh, yeah, 
been 21, yeah, well, 10 years, you know. Do you remember, do you remember what it was like to break, break in? Yeah, I would tell you breaking in CG for film, right? So I had some experiences before. Uh, in film was, you know, I, I remember like the first time I go to a CG studio, uh, it was Rodeo FX. It's a great place, you know, and uh, I, it was really random, dude. I was contacted by one of their lead monitors at the time, super talented guy. And he, he sent me a message and I was working at a completely different thing. I was working in, 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 in marketing and working on my reel because I just got out of school, right? And uh, he told me that he was needing somebody uh, in modeling, right, um, to work in night shifts. So I went there, but here's the thing. They asked me if I knew Softy Max XSI, and I didn't. <laughs> I knew 3D Max, right? But, you know. You figured, I, uh, I just learned it. Uh, and well, I mean, I, I told him, but you know, I, I, I probably, I probably should have, uh, should have known that it was going to be more tricky than it actually thought it was, you know, for a big first job because it's a first software. I mean, sorry, it's a first film studio you're working on, and it's a new software, and you're working on night shifts. So uh, it was a little uh, challenging, but I definitely really uh, enjoyed the experience because uh, that that's what got me started in film and. Uh, um, I really like the studio, so I, I appreciate that opportunity for sure. So if you go back to that time, is there anything you would like to tell young Manuel, sort of like some advice to make that, that passage uh, smoother? Um, I would say, you, I mean, it's, it's hard to speak for everybody, but I would say uh, one thing you can definitely do is put yourself out there, you know, like go to forums i mean at that time i remember c society was you know uh, i mean it still is a, a, a cg website and i was putting images there i was asking questions on the forums and people started noticing you as well right um some of some of the cg people uh were in the forums at that time and i think i think it's good uh for people to put their work out i know that now people are using ArtStation, and that's that's a really good thing to have um, if you're a CG artist starting out, because you know, you, if you want to get a job, you need to uh, stand out from from other people, and a good way to do that is put yourself out there, put your work out there for critic. So yeah, I would say that. Okay, so more exposure, more visibility, possible yeah. harder that way. Yeah, definitely. Was there any sort of turning points along your career where after this point, let's say? finding work became noticeably easier or maybe your skill level or your approach to the work uh, changed, you know, like more like more than a gradual change, a gradual improvement, but, but you know, like uh, something clicked for you and all of a sudden it was like you're turning a corner. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't think there's something in particular that I say, Oh, now I, I just, you know, know something that is so important that, that I can recall. I would say that it's just a continuously be improving. You know, every single job, every single show you have, you need to be constantly growing. And I would say something on that regard, never take something for granted. Never take yourself for granted and never take your work for granted. Never take yourself for granted. Never take your work for granted. Manuel's words have a lot of meaning as we're still in the aftermath of the Hollywood's writer strike, with the actor strike still going on. And green circles are adorning almost all of the visual effects artists' portraits on LinkedIn. It's a hard balance to strike. When we're working, we may so easily trivialize our contributions, particularly since we live in this world of negative focus where reviews are focused on not what works, but what doesn't work and still needs to be improved. So over time, you can certainly start feeling like you never do anything right. It's a tough space to exist in, and one of the constant burdens artists carry through their lives and work. Pushing back against that to keep your mental health and self-esteem intact will 100% fall on you to do. And it's really important to do so on an ongoing basis and preferably way before you burn out. And it's also really important to understand that doing so does not sound like 
These guys are all idiots. They don't deserve me. Now we flipped over to the other extreme. The truth sits somewhere in the middle. But then being without our work, as so many of us are right now, who takes a gig for granted now that we're suffering this mass unemployment and visual effects? I'm a veteran of 12 years of professional texture painting. But the other day I interviewed for a gig with one of the big studios for just two weeks. Two weeks. It's been a long time since I have been willing to consider anything less than six months when it comes to the duration of a gig. But this is not a moment to be choosy or take gigs for granted. It's easy to veer off in the other direction where we take ourselves for granted. And the longer we are without work, the easier it becomes to fantasize about just any job. Working for pennies and taking all kinds of abuse? No problem, I'll do it. Whether the sun is shining or storm clouds are gathering, whether we're starved for work or you got recruiters offering you silly money, whether you are bombarded with notes or praise to the skies, it's really important to keep it all in perspective. Keep that balance. Don't take yourself for granted. Don't take your work for granted. You're never as bad as they say you are. And you're never as good as they say you are. So a saying goes. I think that can be applied to your work as well. For me, personally, this podcast is a personal effort to learn how to do that better. By speaking to artists I respect and admire. Like Manuel here. Never take something for granted. Never take yourself for granted and never take your work for granted. Because there's always room for improvement and there's always room for improvement uh, for the work and for your perspective about work as well, you know? Okay. So I think that, yeah, I mean, there's there's just uh, each show has, has something new. Would you still... So I, I think of you as a texture artist. Obviously, you know how to model as well. You you know lighting. You know a lot of, of disciplines. If you'd start out again tomorrow, would you still go down the route of, uh, of surfacing, texture, shading, look at that kind of stuff? Or would you pick something completely different, like, I don't know, compositors? There's, they always have work. There's all oh, no. people always need compositors. Dude, those are the ones that stay the latest. I, I know they, they're just ghosts at the end of the production. Just uh, yeah. yeah, just bone skin and bones, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Okay, uh, but how about effects guys? Good effect, a good effects guy. He can pretty much set whatever rate he wants. You know, he just asks whatever money he wants. Um. Yeah, I think I think if you if you have uh, you know the experience and the negotiation skills, you can get you know something decent you know it also depends on the, the timing but i would say um i will definitely pick a look different textures because uh i mean isn't every isn't there anything more fun than making dirty surfaces mark tell me hey uh, don't ask me i can talk i can talk to a kingdom would you come prefer about like like coding python you know i i've learned a bit of python because i feel like i i need to know a bit you know and Did i sort of sorry did you enjoy it? Um, it was a lot easier than other programming languages I've learned. So that's no. <laughs> well, what I'm trying to say, it could be a lot worse. You know? Yeah, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, of course. But I, I think to, there you're making something that so many people will, you know, when we make an asset, we make something that can be used in many shots. A shot is only used one time, right? Whether yes. that is composting, lighting, animation. But when you're you, when you're making stuff for pipeline you're you're you making something that so many people will enjoy and that will be used over Dude, and over I have, I have the most respect for people that can do that because I, I i definitely i definitely don't have uh, strength in coding you know i mean i would lie if i say that but um yeah i do like uh texture and look that work because you know it's it's something that it's to me fresh I, you can always find you know new ways of you know, breaking a surface, new way of, you know, getting those little break up on the spec. And, you know, there's always something, something new in any surface. So, yeah. Have you ever had an asset that, that broke you an asset where you're like, 
you know what? I, I just don't know. I can't do this. I don't know what to do with this. Um, an acid that broke me. I would say I had timelines that broke me. Okay. <laughs> Uh, yeah, for sure. I mean, there's there's always something that you're like, ah, you know, this one. Um, uh, I would say challenging one, uh, just because of the, the project was a little tricky in timelines. Was I was working on Bloodshot, doing some some robotic arms, and um, it, it it was challenging because of I would say for the the production itself was uh, uh, very short in times and. Um, you know, it was a little challenging to 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 get something fast and also looking good due to time constraints. I think we did. So yeah, I would say that. But uh, other than that, yeah, I I don't have one that I can recall. Oh, this is like the, the hardest one. You know. See, this is this is my thing about surfacing work that it's um we are basically recreating reality, and reality yep. is infinitely complex. Yes. I mean, you can always do something that can fool the eye from like 50 yards away. But if you need to be like all the way up close, you know, mm -hmm. that's a different story. So completely, completely. And um, uh, I mean, the little things are what break uh, an image, right? Like those uh, like scale, uh, does it look too procedural? You know, does it does it look like uh, too generic, doesn't look interesting enough. You know, all those questions um, that you constantly ask to, to make something look good, right? So this is, I'm, I don't know why I'm so obsessed. I'm obsessed with timelines and progressing over an artist's career and life, you know? What, mm -hmm. what does the beginning look like? I know what that looks like. And it's pretty similar for most people. What does the middle look like? And what does the end look like? The end, so... So you and I, so I'm like eight, nine years in, and you're mm -hmm. 11 years in or something, right? Mm -hmm. so, so around the decade. Around, yeah. So as you know, I was talking to the other day, I was talking to an artist that is 22 years into texturing. Wow. Yeah. And she, at this point, is like, there is no acid she can't do. For sure. <laughs> and, and, it, and it's been a long time that it's been for a long time it's been like that you know that's cool yeah and i have to say that's definitely the level above me i still meet assets from time to time where i'm like puzzled by them and i'm like what am i going to do this how am i i can't make this work right and whatever whatever and it takes me too long to push yeah. through it you know mm -hmm. so this is just those steps you know <laughs> that so i'm looking forward to getting to that level where it's just like any asset whatever I, of course, that level has different challenges. Now you have mm -hmm. other challenges. So, but it's, um, but it's a bit like it's a bit like if you ask a baby to lift a heavy dumbbell. <laughs> no matter how motivated it is, it just can't do it. Whereas yeah. that weight may be easy for a grown up. You know, that's true. I would say, um, you know, you're always going to have stuff that challenge you. You know, and I hope that's the case, you know, because if you don't have things that challenge you, you're going to get bored, right? And like I was saying earlier, if you don't have enough stress or enough, some, something enough uh, interesting that, that challenges you, then you're not going to, you know, you're probably not going to give like 110% from yourself and trying to, you know, understand what you need to do for, for that particular asset. Um, I would say one thing um, learning to, 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 to go against is to, Always use the same formulas for every asset. You've heard me talk about checklists before, or maybe I've just alluded to it. It is certainly worth an episode at some point. The concept of checklists was originally invented to prevent disasters for pilots. Pilots who must be one of the most well-trained and heavily scrutinized professions of all. Of course, also one that routinely handles life and death. Surgeons also use checklists. These are not coincidences. When the chips are down and you need to deliver quality with low probability of error, preferably fast and often under pressure, checklists are indispensable. Formulas, checklists, recipes, just call them what you will. But you owe it to yourself 
no matter what discipline you work in, to start building a personal checklist for your work. Break the steps of your work down and over time analyze and refine and improve on the order of the individual steps or the way that you do them. It will help you to attain speed and confidence in your work. It will make you a better professional and a better artist. Although, of course, there are techniques at work, you know, that you can use a technique for this asset. And, you know, to a certain degree, that technique's going to work. And, you know, this type of asset has that technique that's going to work as well. But always question, go back to question the technique. What if, you know, you can go in a simple route? You don't need to go super complex or maybe you need to go super complex, you know. But I think that uh, like any, I would say, any artist in any other domain, constantly question your work and the way you're doing your stuff you know if you go to to a painter's atelier you're gonna sign, you're gonna see you know like a bunch of like drawings and it, to you it, it might it might look like you know like nothing but to that guy it's like uh you know it's that's that's like all their all their ideas you know they're just you know in different papers and that somehow you know it's gonna make that when he makes a, a painting there's some of that training that is gonna show in the work absolutely so i think it's the same do you have do you have a, a technique or a, a formula or something that's sort of a rough guideline for how you attack an asset i would say uh i would i would copy something that somebody told me one day so uh i was working with a dude one time and he told me look manuel the first thing you need to do when you get an asset is finish the modeling i was like what do you mean like modeling the thing no 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 break the surface with displacement and bump just break break the spec you know like put some rough you know like bump and and some if you have displacement put the, and see how it reads you know see how the ior reads see how the specular reads and then start introducing color and other type of maps that are going to break things you know coatings and dust and anything you want but to me uh, that was uh, a good tip you know i would say because um uh, a surface can read with any color you know of course colors are super important you know but the surface from a look at the point of view needs to read you know is it too rough is it not rough enough is there too much breakup is there not enough breakup value change uh, softness change you know there's so many things that are subtle but that either make it or break it you know that you can do and you know that's just my my workflow some people like to start with diffuse and then go to the other maps but you know Everybody have a different way of doing things. I, th I think that makes a lot of sense. I think when we were kids, we think about, we think painting is only about color. You know, mm -hmm. when you've got like a crayon or whatever little kids are drawing with or painting with, or they are having those coloring books where they're filling in the drawings. Yeah. It's that's all, true. it's all color, color, color. That's all we, mm -hmm. that's, that's what we think that is all there is. But you're mm -hmm. right. You're right. I, I see, I used to, then I was taught that the spec map is the most uh, most valuable player so to speak of the team you know but and, but then yeah. then i heard a, a different story of that again that was from the guy that uh, that did the thanos in um, in avengers endgame cool yeah he i mean my goodness if that was me i would have a tattoo on my forehead <laughs> <laughs> that's a cool asset for sure <laughs> oh ab absolutely but he was saying he was saying how basically the reason why this displacement and bump is so important is because mm -hmm. in reality, there very rarely is any specular differences. Absolutely. We paint in specular differences, but really what they are, if you look at that surface in reality, it is differences yeah. in bump and breakup. Exactly. Is there, bump is and a... displacement. So start there and then you will have much, much less need for all the other things yeah. absolutely that's you know i mean real life that's you know a surface it's, it has like a lot of micro uh you know bumps if Ab you want you absolutely know? Yeah. and the light gets trapped and you know if you look at from very close you know uh, concrete or anything you're gonna see that of course you know in the real surface that you can see those bumps you know sometimes you try to fake that and push that um and, and fake that with a reflection map and then it somehow starts to look dirty and the response of the reflection is not natural, you know? So I would say if, if your surface reads clean and, and has a plausible range with uh, just like displacement bump and IOR tweaks, 
then you move on to like other maps. That that's when you're doing look defined texturing. Because if you're just doing texturing, of course, you can, you know, just focus on getting like good ranges on the maps and like that's a craft of itself. But I'm I'm talking from a hybrid point of view, you know, like you're doing both look diff and texturing for an asset. So yeah. I must say the moment when there was a point, there was one uh, one show where I was pretty much forced to do my own look dev. Mm -hmm. And at first it feels uncomfortable if you're a texture artist, but after a while you stop fearing it and you see what it brings to you. You start, you now have the full picture of the, of the surfacing, do you know, mm -hmm. you understand. And I think before that point, I was probably over texturing everything. I thought it needed textures on everything when it could be handled <laughs> in the shader, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think that, um, one of the things sometimes, you know, uh, happens is too much dirt. You know, of course things are dirty, right? But just that grimy look that looks super CG, right? Like, like no. I, I think that happens. That's, what happens is th that's what you did with the motorcycle, with the Ducati. It was just so subtle. <laughs> it was so subtle, my goodness. I, I would say, dude, like, uh, seriously, um, different IORs, you know, like different reflections and different reflection uh, responses, you know, that very subtle uh, coatings, you know, are going to break a surface, you know, like just a little bit of uh, dust, a little bit of crunch, a little bit less glossy, a little bit more glossy, very subtle, very subtle always. But that when it's, you know, moving and light is hitting it, you're going to see that reflection change. And that's, that's what you want. One thing I wanted to ask you about is sort of like, I, I, I think of it sort of like a Jedi mind trick. Manuel will be back in a future episode. Thanks for spending a little bit of your day with us. We have a tiny bit of housekeeping to do on the way out. If this episode has been helpful to you, why not share the podcast with your colleagues and friends? If you'd like to support the podcast, I'd appreciate if you bought me a coffee. You can do that on coffee. That is spelled ko-fi.com forward slash the naked texture artist. One word. If you have suggestions, comments or questions, I'd love to hear them. Feel free to drop me a line on the naked texture artist at gmail.com. That is the naked texture artist written out in all one word at gmail.com. As I mentioned, having a busy day job in visual effects means my release schedule for this podcast can be a bit irregular. So if you don't want to miss out, subscribe to the naked texture artist wherever you get your podcasts or follow the podcast on the socials, then you'll be alerted when the next episode drops. The music in this episode was Awake by Tycho. Nick Sifoni helped put the sound together and everything else was done by me, your host, Mark Pierre Sondergaard. Speak to you soon.